wonderful to be here. This is actually the first time I'm giving this talk, so if everyone has ever seen me giving this talk before, I want to know where you got your time machine. Uh, uh, I want to thank uh, Scott for mentioning the talk. It is sort of a sort of a thinker talk, a little more than a technical talk. Uh, but I think you're going to see from this talk an interesting vision of where we think Postgres is going in the next, say, five years. Uh, the idea for this talk actually came uh, from Josh Burgess, but I found out this morning even earlier from Dave Page the idea that Postgres uh, really makes an excellent uh, option for being sort of a central part of your data center, a little different than uh, what a tip the role of a typical database. And uh, that's what this presentation is going to highlight. Now, um, one thing I want to mention before I start, um, as you noticed, if you were here for Dave's talk, he made a little drawing at the end. We will be uh, making a little drawing at the end of this uh, session as well. For, um, for a class, an enterprise DB class, uh, or of course enterprise DB. Uh, Matt actually is going to be going around picking up cards, so if you sort of didn't get a chance to put anything in the, the cool little like thing, with the cool top on it, I might know. Uh, yeah, we thought that was like the buzzer you hit, you know, when you're at the game show. Uh, <laughs> feel free to uh, kind of sit something in there. Uh, I think it's a three-day class, I do a lot of training. Uh, for enterprise DB. One of the reasons I do training actually is because, as you may know, there are not enough trained Postgres uh, administrators. And that obviously is a serious uh, impediment to Postgres adoption. So uh, enterprise DB has been uh, sort of, among many other companies, has been part of that to kind of lead people uh, to gain uh, training in Postgres. And hopefully that's going to help organizations need to hire people. So, again, uh, just part of uh, some of the things that we do uh, as a company, but again, also my community duties uh, uh, align very well with the idea of training. So, um, I can say that, let's, let's get started. Um, effectively, what we're going to talk about today uh, are, are four main aspects of Postgres that I think help make it, uh, give it a unique position within your data center. Uh, these are not things sort of exclusive to Postgres, but when you kind of put them all together, it does Postgres, put Postgres in a, in a very unique light. Uh, I know a lot of, there's a lot of sort of buzz about sort of new database technologies and, and, and things that are sort of taking databases into new directions, and of course uh, Postgres is part of that. Uh, but some of the flexibility of Postgres, some of its ability to uh, to subsume new workloads. These are, again, uh, part of the aspects I'm going to be talking about. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about Postgres's object relational uh, behavior. That may sound really sort of high techy or kind of uh, maybe buzzwordy compliant to you, but uh, there actually is quite a bit of history behind why that is important. And I'm going to illustrate why I think it's a significant part of what makes Postgres uh, uniquely positioned to function as uh, a central place in your data center. Then we'll talk about some uh, specific examples first, the ability of Postgres to uh, handle NoSQL workloads, and I'll go through specifics of that. Again, NoSQL is not sort of a single technology, but a group of uh, roughly four technologies, and I'll go in and I'll explain what that means. Third, we'll talk about data analytics and how Postgres has been involved uh, in that area. Uh, and then finally, uh, foreign data wrappers, which you've probably heard a little bit about. You might sort of understand what it means, but I'm going to kind of give it hopefully some concreteness and explain how it gives you so much additional flexibility as, uh, as an administrator that you might not have had before. And then finally, I'll finish talking about Postgres Central role and what I think we're going in uh, the next five years, and then we'll, we'll open it up to questions. In fact, does anyone have any questions before we get started about these topics? So, uh, Postgres, object relation, what does that mean? Uh, first, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that Postgres is an object database. Maybe you've heard of object databases before. Uh, it's sort of a hybrid between the idea of an object database where you're, you're really not a relational system, where everything is an object, uh, and a relational system. Uh, it basically supports a number of object features like classes and inheritance, but that, uh, but most importantly, 
it effectively means that everything in the database is an object that can be easily manipulated. Uh, and you might say, well, why would I want to manipulate some objects? Uh, I'm going to give you some very good examples of that. Uh, and it starts to show, I think, the value of, of looking at Postgres as a data platform. Again, um, Scott in his keynote this morning did talk about Postgres as a, as a data platform. And I think we're going to see we're going to see more and more of that. Uh, when I originally started with Postgres in '96, um, I have to admit that I, I kind of uh, uh, didn't like the object relational system. Uh, didn't like is, is, is sort of a euphemism for saying it was really a pain to work in an object relational system from a database internals perspective uh, because instead of being able to look at a field and say Oh, that's an integer column. You had to do all sorts of gymnastics to basically interpolate what the column was and what system table look up and all this other crazy stuff. And there were all sorts of bugs, again, in the early, in the late 90s associated with how Postgres, um, you know, had to properly handle the object aspect, object relational aspects of the system. Fortunately, all that is behind us. Um, the system is actually very good at doing this. Uh, and there are a number of facilities that I'm going to go over that actually do uh, highlight and take advantage of optimal relational aspects of Postgres. So let's let's get specific here. Uh, I've mentioned the system catalogs. This is actually what they look like. I'm not expecting anybody to understand that, but what it's trying to highlight here is that um, uh, most systems have system catalogs. You know, you look at tra traditional relational database, they have a system catalog. They may also have an information schema that's built on top of that. And they define various aspects of the system. Uh, some of them are very large system catalogs, some of them are, are minimal. Um, but what's really interesting about Postgres is that we have a tendency to define things in the system catalogs that a normal system might not define. Things like data type functions, so forth. And um, the ability or the requirement actually to have everything that's defined in the system table gives Postgres a lot of the flexibility that I think is important in uh, some of, of the idea of using Postgres as, um, as sort of a central part of your data center. So um, you might think, well, I'm, I'm kind of making this up. Uh, here's an example of uh, the creation of an extension. If you were here for Dave Page's talk, um, he actually talked about Postgres extensions and showed you an example of loading the PG uh, Reform uh, thing. Here's basically up in red here, we have create extension. And as soon as I type create extension and it gets loaded in, effectively what I have here are some new data types that did not exist before I created that extension. Okay? As you can see, it's very easy to do. Um, you know, these might not be super exciting data types to you unless you're uh, involved in, in handling things like UPC codes or music. Uh, serial actually is, I think, for magazines or books. Uh, magazines and then books at the top there, ISDN, you've probably heard of that before. Um, but effectively, what we're highlighting here is the idea of uh, creating sort of new data types like just on the fly, without changing the Postgres binary, without doing anything fancy. We're basically just loading in uh, a shared object file that had been recompiled that normally comes with Postgres, and all of a sudden I've changed what I can do with Postgres. I've changed how I can what data I can store in Postgres. Um, now you might have dealt with um, you might have dealt with sort of plugins before. You might have dealt with um, you know extensible database uh, options in other SERP systems. And if you kind of groan or you sort of have a queasy feeling in your stomach uh, thinking of doing this again, um, I don't blame you. Uh, a lot of the relational systems that have pluggable architectures have a pluggable architecture that is fairly fragile. Um, I'm not going to name any names, but what happens in a lot of these uh, relational systems that start to add pluggability is that the system A wasn't designed originally for pluggability. Uh, B, the system is an open source, so the people writing the plugins have a limited API of what they can control. Okay? And often, even if you can get the thing to work, there's all sorts of parts of the system that don't know about the pluggability. So all of a sudden, 
you can create a plugin data type, but you can't use it for partitioning, or you can't use it for uh, in certain index types. Okay, so there's all these. Um, you know, plugability is not something new. It has been around. It certainly has been in Postgres since the mid '80s uh, when when development was started on Postgres. But it's really starting to take off. And again, it takes off in Postgres not because it's sort of this bolted-on thing, but because it's actually part of the system. It's part of the DNA of what Postgres is. And if you look at the next five years and you look at new data needs and additional data types and new indexing types. And, um, New programming languages, that server-side programming languages, all sorts of things that can take Postgres into new data needs. This object-relational ability, this extensibility, this plugin ability is absolutely key to that behavior. Uh, so, for example, here, if I do, uh, and I, again, <coughs> highlighting the fact that I said that the, 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 a plugin behaves just like an ordinary system; it works just the same across. All the capabilities of Postgres. Here I'm actually in PSQL. I said, give me all your data types. And I actually see two lines. I'm just highlighting two lines here. What, the first line is, is the actual integer data type that comes as part of Postgres. So pretty much every database has an integer data type. Um, Postgres has an integer data type. It comes in pre compiled with Postgres. And it appears just like this in the PSQL display. And right underneath it, you have the data type that I just installed in, on that slot. Okay? ISBN is actually a data type. Now I have this data type right here. I have the integer data type, I have the ISBN data type. There's no way as a user for you to really figure out which one was built in and which one wasn't. There's no real great way uh, of sort of saying, well, integer works everywhere and ISPN only works in certain places. That's not the way it is with Postgres. The data type is the data type. The system tables abstract out all the differences between uh, the, 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 you know, every data type in the system. So every data type, whether it's built in or plug in, follows the same rules. They all have the same behavior. Here's a, a, a much more explicit example. I'm actually addressing the system tables. I'm looking at that. I'm looking here at, um, let's see, unfortunately this, where is my pointer? It's not, there it is, I'm sorry. So there's the PG type uh, system table, and I'm saying, give me the integer data type that's built into Postgres. It happens to be called int4 internally. Again, you can access it as integer, but int4 is the internal name. And what you can see down here in red is that effectively I have defined four functions that uniquely identify what an integer looks like, how it's output, and so forth. If I do the same thing with the ISBN data type, which is the data type that I just installed, it looks virtually identical. It's got the same columns. Uh, the only real major difference here is that they have different functions, which we would expect for input and output of a book number, which was going to be different than input output of an integer. So again, looks pretty much the same. Again, some of the fields are slightly different, but the idea is that all those, all those data types follow the same rules, so therefore they all behave the same. Um, another example, you might say, oh, well, data types, what else can I do? Languages. Postgres probably supports 12, you know, 14, 16 different server-side languages. There are a number of examples, uh, uh, advantages to this. For example, if you're writing your application in Python, the idea of being able to write your stored procedures in the same language as your application allows for very easy movement of code between your client into your server and back again. Your users have one API, they have one language to sort of focus on. If you're doing it in Perl, same thing, you have PL Perl. If you're doing it in Java, same thing, you have PL Java. Again, uh, you know, if you're doing stuff in JSON, you have uh, PLV8. So you have the ability, again, to use all these four procedure languages. But a lot of them are plugins. In fact, they're almost all of them are plugins. They all behave as plugins. Here's an example of PL Python. And again, I'm doing a list of languages. The first one, PLPGSQL, is installed by default. The second one, PLPython U, which happens to be a plugin. Looks exactly the same. So again, I said uh, 15. I'm only listing probably the big popular ones here. Uh, 
Again, um, one thing I should mention is a lot of URLs at the bottom. If, uh, if you find that you want to look up some more detail about this stuff, feel free to do that. Um, I should have also mentioned that this presentation, along with about 30 others, uh, is available at that URL right there. So uh, if you can barely spell Momjin in Google, it will take you there. And um, there's a little presentation tab, and, and you can see this presentation. Although it's not online right now, because I'm only going to put it online after the talk. So give me about 10 minutes to get it up. Uh, there's a placeholder there, but I didn't, uh, I didn't actually put it up yet. Um, so, uh, I'm sorry, I, I popped past here. So again, uh, we have a whole bunch of languages that are available in Postgres. Uh, we have a bunch of specialized indexing methods. Again, you would assume that indexing would be something built in and something you can't add to Postgres. In fact, you actually can. Um, we have a whole bunch of very specialized ones. Jin, Gist, I think uh, Dave mentioned that in his presentation. Space Partition Gist. Um, again, really interesting that these are actually uh, installed with Postgres, but again, could potentially be plugins as well. Um, it makes it very easy for development of, of this, and, and fortunately, uh, we have some very capable people um, who always seem to be located in Russia, uh, who, who, are, who just love indexing. And uh, I'll tell you, you know, they build runs for us every year, uh, in giving us some of the cool stuff. Uh, P, uh, for example, JSON B has a very sophisticated, sophisticated gin index type, uh, which happens to index all the keys and all the values uh, in your JSON document really efficiently. Um, and, and again, it's sort of a game changer for us. So we continue to get uh, tremendous stuff. And again, because the indexing at least is isolated and it's a container, it makes it very easy to develop. And again, if you look at the system table, PJM, access method, you can see all the index. Okay, operators, you would think that well, operators are a plug in and we wouldn't want to do that. Well, in fact, uh, operators are actually defined in the system table. So if you wanted to add an operator like plus sign, minus sign, double that, uh, uh, double that should work. Uh, double question mark, uh, you can actually define your own operators to do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, casts are in there, aggregates are actually. Uh, the final system table, again, adding uh, you know, a creature and as it's if you want to. Uh, what are some examples of some systems that actually make use of this? PostGIS is a ge geographical information system been developed for years. Uh, they actually have no requests to us. They just develop GIS on their own. They see the API that we provide for them. It has been complete for probably eight years. I don't think they've asked for any changes. So it's a good example of the fact that you can develop a very sophisticated uh, plugin that you does geographic information system effectively given the existing API. Postgres, PLV8, server side language, again, developed externally. Um, and again, uh, things like full text search was actually developed externally and then loaded and then eventually brought into the core. So the idea of these plugins are really, really powerful. Um, another reason Postgres, optic relational, I've taken the Postgres source code and either use the source code or extensibility, again, as a data platform to develop additional, um, you know, sort of data options uh, for, uh, for companies. Okay? Uh, this is a slide that kind of goes over some of the history. Again, if you want to look at the full slide, you've got to go to the URL. All right? Plugins not so. In summary, plugins not a bad word. I know other databases have all sorts of special cases around them. That is not true with Postgres. So um, you're not really using the full advantage of Postgres unless you're taking advantage of that extensibility and using uh, some of the abilities to change the way Postgres works. Okay. Um, how do you actually do this? Uh, effectively, some of the data types, like the ones on the left. Um, uh, are actually built in, and then you have the ability to load in many of these extensions um, on your own. Okay, any questions? Great, all right, good. So the next big one, no SQL. Obviously a lot of buzz around this. People are uh, super excited about new ways of storing data and new ways of uh, retrieving that data very rapidly. Um, this has been a big challenge, technically, 
industry or at least uh, uh, sort of market perception wise to relational systems. Uh, the challenges to relational systems are not new. Uh, we had XML databases years ago, uh, Postgres and other relational systems subsumed some of, the, some of the sort of feature set from XML databases and gave you sort of the best of both worlds. Uh, we had object databases, which I mentioned at the beginning. Again, we subsumed a lot of that capability um, uh, as, you know, as a, an object relational system. And we now have NoSQL. And as you can see from the, the features that Postgres is putting, putting out in the past couple of years, uh, we now are understanding the desire and the need to do uh, different uh, options, I give users different options for uh, than, than strictly relational, okay? And we've been sort of extending Postgres in various areas. I think Scott actually talked about a really interesting concept this morning when he said, there's a Doppler effect when you're developing an app. So when you are approaching the app, you know, it looks one way, but then as you develop it, then you're, you're going past it, you're looking back at it, it looks different. Um, and I think a lot of the history has been, and he mentioned the hype cycle and so forth, the history has been that, that when applications start, they assume, I don't need a schema, and I'm just going to sort of throw the data in there. Uh, but uh, again, as we start to get a little farther down, um, the the value of having some structure to it and manageability and maintainability has a lot of advantages. And we believe that Postgres uh, is sort of uniquely set up to give you sort of the best of both worlds. So um, let's get specific. There's actually, as I said in, in the intro, there's actually not one NoSQL type of database. In my mind um, and the minds of people who actually study the industry, there's probably four major ones. Uh, so the first one being a uh, key value store, so that would be something like Redis. Uh, document databases would be, uh, and, and mostly JSON, although there are other document types of stores. Uh, MongoDB being the popular one there. Uh, columnar stores, uh, that would be Cassandra. And then graph databases, which would be Node.js. Now, uh, again, none of these technologies are really new. Uh, we, we had key value stores way back, way back in the, you know, in the ISAM days, right, or C-Tree, if any of you ever did that. Um, so they're not completely new, but again, there are some, some needs for volume, some needs for, uh, for shardability and, and particularly horizontal scaling that, that, you know, have some advantages to doing that. And again, uh, Postgres is sort of going to try and give you the best of both worlds. But I'll show you later, we actually uh, can also interface to those systems. Uh, so again, we're not, we're not sort of putting our, our uh, you know, stake in the sand in one place. Uh, but I do think that we're doing some really interesting stuff. So why does NoSQL exist? Um, again, uh, NoSQL is great if you need really fast clearing. Uh, it's really good for auto sharding because you're not doing any of the sort of joins that you would typically do. Um, and it's obviously very good uh, by having flexible schemas. Uh, but to get those things, you're really sort of having to get rid of, or to, to, a, to not have, a, a powerful query language, an optimizer that allows you to sim have, create a simpler application where a central server can do the, the optimization for you. Uh, data normalization, keeping your data same, a lot of times that has to follow the application. Uh, joining data from, from multiple sources or multiple data stores, again, falls the application. Referential integrity falls the application. Um, and, and in some cases, durability either is not there or falls to the administrator to deal with. Uh, now, I'm not saying that you know, NoSQL is not a great option in some cases. What I am saying, that is the free lunch. And I think everybody, even in the NoSQL world, will say, well, I just, you know, it's a free lunch for me. Uh, you are going to be giving up some things. And you as administrators and developers have to decide, okay, you know, do I need, uh, you know, do I need performance and auto sharding and flexible schemas that much that I have to go with a pure NoSQL solution would I be better off using a solution like Postgres that has the ability to deal with this type of data um, and also give me a lot of the benefits that I've listed here? Now, um, yes, sir. And what I would add to that first, if I may, 
is you're giving up joins referential integrity with a system like this up front. What happens if your requirements change and all of a sudden you do need those things and you do need multi-document transactions? Yeah, and I think you and I talked about this, that, that, that when you're starting your app, you think it's going to do, we need to only do one thing, right? And, and NoSQL might be a great fit for you, but as the application evolves and you need to get it made in different ways, where you have your requirements change, right? Then all of a sudden, you know, are you locked into a system that effectively can't meet that and you're going to have to do all sorts of gymnastics to get what you need? Um, and I think, I think some of the value, some of the sort of hype around NoSQL has been the idea that going in, it, it appears to be a perfect match for what you need, but applications rarely stay static. Um, and the requirements change, the need to get it, the data changes, um, and the question is, 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 is a pure NoSQL solution going to be able to evolve your, your application in the proper way, in an efficient way? Uh, and, 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 and that's a tough question, because you, know, you, you can't predict the future, right? Um, but that's a, that's a great point, Scott, thank you. Um, so, um, again, what, what are the drawbacks? Uh, obviously, reporting, usually when people start an application, they don't think about reporting. Uh, but again, as the application goes into production, reporting becomes an issue. Uh, is that something you're going to be able to do easily in a pure NoSQL solution? Uh, are you going to be able to handle complex application design uh, with no optimizer and so forth? Um, durability, how are you going to handle that? What's, what's your strategy? Uh, is that something you want to take on? Um, and in fact, you know, I listed on this slide fast query, but again, as Dave Page showed in, in his comparison of JSONB with Mongo in 9.4, uh, there's a sense that, that you may not need to give up performance to go with a Postgres hybrid solution. Because uh, we have some really, really smart people. Now, I must say, Mongo doesn't have smart people, and Redis, and so forth, but um, there's sort of an infrastructure around Postgres that really provides some cutting edge, best of breed performance. Uh, it could, you know, it, it could be in relation to how we store the data. It could be in relation to some of the indexing methods we have. Uh, in relation to the way we do optimizations, um, and, and those things are really powerful. So we're not even really willing to give away uh, performance and say you're going to have to suffer. Performance uh, to go with a hybrid solution. Um, there, there's some just really interesting stuff here. Uh, so when you should you use NoSQL? When does that make sense? Well, um, certainly massive write scaling might be one reason, uh, particularly if you need to go across multiple servers. Again, uh, relational systems don't really shine when you're uh, doing horizontal scaling because the joins become very complex. Uh, you have to implement some type of sharding. Uh, this is not true for read scaling. It's mostly write scaling, uh, where you're going to have some difficulty in a relational system, and NoSQL might make sense there. Uh, do you have really simple data access patterns? And are you sure they're going to stay simple? Right? Is that, you know, that might be you. You know, if you're doing Twitter, you might have needs for massive horizontal scaling, write scaling, and you might know your API is going to be just really simple. Um, and and, and you know, durability may not be a problem for you. You don't care if you lose a couple tweets. You might have you know billions of dollars, uh, like Twitter probably does, to to write super complex applications to get that white scaling. Um, again, you might not have strong retention, and you might have you know you might have not worry about um, uh, you know data integrity, right? Because uh, they're just tweets, right? So again, that might work, but is that your workload? Maybe, maybe, you know, maybe it's not everybody's workload, I can tell you that much. It's probably not the majority of people's workload. Um, so, you know, it, it's sort of like everyone wants to drive like a sports car, but, or a car that we would run in like an Indy race, but you know, it's really uncomfortable. Uh, we kind of have some problems on the road. Potholes, they don't handle too well. Uh, so, uh, just be aware that if you're going for a system that only the big boys use, uh, be aware that this may not be the most comfortable ride, um, and, and it might require a lot of work on your part, uh, and, and that might be okay, uh, that might not be okay. Um, another area I, that I actually 
actually one that hit on the bottom there, is the idea of uh, where column compression is very useful. Uh, that's a case where a column or data like Cassandra might make sense. Uh, particularly things like analyzing huge amounts of log files that are technically unstructured but have a lot of duplicates in them. Um, that might be an example where, where NoSQL would make sense, and I wanted to highlight that one. So when you should do relational, again, it's the opposite. When you need easy administration, when you have variable workloads and reporting, again, a lot of your work is sort of pushed up the database server where it does all the heavy work for you. Uh, simplifies application development, um, and when you need strong data retention. Uh, these are obviously areas where relational systems shine. You can get the best of both worlds. Um, Postgres does support a number of schemaless data types that I'm going to talk about. It can use very sophisticated indexing on those schemaless types, but just because they're schemaless doesn't mean we can't index them. Uh, I know that sounds undoable, but we can do it. Uh, thanks to our Russians and some other friends that we have. Um, you're not going to give up uh, transactions. Uh, Postgres is going to allow for transaction schema changes. That's an area we've always shown in, uh, where you can do DDL in transactions in a very powerful way. Uh, that makes it very efficient to do schema changes. Uh, durable in by default, but again, we have some. Uh, we have that controllable per table and per transaction. So if you want to loosen durability for performance, Postgres gives you that option. And then we do have some auto sharding solutions um, that, that are available for Postgres. Uh, example of schemaless data, JSON. Um, effectively here we're uh, creating a JSON column and we're putting two uh, fields in there, name and age. Uh, just an example, I can actually access the name field here. Then I can access um, a, a restriction here uh, in the where clause and access the, the keys uh, within there. Uh, schemaless data changes, I can do things like alter table either uh, inside of the transaction. So here I'm doing, I'm adding a column within a transaction, uh, outside the transaction. But I can actually add two columns here and do a rename of the actual table within a transaction. The cool thing about this is that A, you can roll it back, and B, it happens all at once. So everyone <coughs> will see the change atomically. You won't basically see part of the change and then another part will come across. Um, and it does, it does allow for cool things. <coughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. With the JSON, it seems like when you're developing schemas, you think about what you want to index on, and this seems to like totally remove that requirement because you can just shove all your data in one column and still get all the benefits. So the question is, um, it seems like normally when you're doing JSON, you have to identify what the keys are, and then um, what you're saying is that it sounds like with this system, you always don't have to do that, and you can just sort of get your data however you want. And the answer is yes. Um, in 9.3, the JSON type is a text. And therefore, you're having to parse the JSON to get things out. Now, you can create indexes on specific JSON fields or multiple JSON fields, okay? If you want to, in 9.3, it will pre-index the values of those particular keys, and you can do very rapid lookups. What's interesting is 9.4 is A, we have the JSON B data type, which is binary, which does allow us to index all of the JSON fields. Okay, in a very efficient manner. That was the, the hash, JSON hash, JSONB hash data uh, index type that he created. Um, and what it effectively does, and again, this is sort of all new code, but it's in, um, it effectively takes each key and each value and then hashes it and stores a hash of the value up in a JIN index, which is super fast, um, and then allows you to kind of pull arbitrary things out of there really fast. And that was the number, the, in the uh, performance number that Dave showed, the 1.1 milliseconds thing. Um, so that, that was kind of highlighted in, in, at the Dublin conference. And the cool thing about that is uh, Alexander Kirchhoff um, actually presented it um, because he had thought of it the day before at the conference. We were, I guess somebody was talking to him, it might have been me, I don't know who it was. We were talking about some of the indexing options. I said, can you do this or can you do that? 
Um, so they eventually, they basically developed the patch over value max and performance numbers, and then in their talk they showed some comparisons. So what was really kind of hit my, and I even blogged about it, well, A, he presented it and he got, he got applause in the talk about a QSQL output, which is pretty big, right? Not very often you put a slide up with SQL and you get applause in the movie. Um, but what's really interesting is that instead of being able to index one key, which is typically what a NoSQL thing, limitation to what is it, he's indexed all the fields, all the keys of the JSON, and he's, he's actually got results faster than the NoSQL model solution. So he's got something that's keying all the values that are one, and it's faster, right? That's a game changer, right? Faster is great, keying everything's great. Doing both of them at the same time, that's, that's applause, right? Um, so that, that alone is exciting. Um, and, and there is, this is sort of a game changer for us, I think, in what we do. And, and again, it's going to take a while, and 9 4 won't be out for six months, and again, you know, we, it's going to take a while for this all to kind of sink in. Um, but again, great example of Postgres being at the data, the center of the data center and able to do some really sophisticated stuff. Yes, sir? Um, what is the impact on the right? Yeah, so that's a great question. What's the impact on the right? The right is the big problem. So um, the way a right works in Postgres is that effectively we're going to have to create a new row to match the existing row with whatever changes you've made. Okay? It's possible that NoSQL solutions will still be better at making individual key changes depending on how they implement a change of a key. Because Postgres is MVCC transactional, we have to keep the old row around and then create a new row. Okay? So effectively, um, it's possible that, that not so much inserts, which would pretty much be the same, but my guess is that updates may be faster in a system that does not have to honor MVCC. Because they could just change the field in place. Postgres is not able to do that, again, because it's part of a larger transaction system that has to honor MVCC. So that, that's a great example. That may be a case uh, where if you're changing keys a lot, that Postgres would be slow. And can we stop this indexing? Can you stop, I'm sorry, can like, we stop the indexing? Like, okay, we have very specific data indexes if we want on right. the JSON. Yeah. So do we ever do the same on just JSON B or does it enable by default? Okay, so the question is, is the indexing always there in JSON B or do you create it? You have to create it. So you can, you can create an index even on JSONB on individual fields using what's called an expression index, or you can index the whole thing. And that's really up to you. You may not want everything indexed. You may just want one key index. But again, you make that decision. You can add or remove indexes wherever you want. We don't automatically index anything. We, we, in JSONB, we, we, auto, we automatically um, store it as binary, but we don't necessarily index it. Uh, so we can get multiple indexes, index different indexing types, uh, whatever it fits your, and again, part of the flexibility of a relational system on top of that that allows you to make those changes and add and remove things as necessary. So if we don't index anything, I really should not have any back on the right performance. So if you don't index anything, then your updates are still going to create a new copy of the row, but there will be no overhead on the I'm sorry, you're more efficient, I think, than uh, someone Right. Yeah, we still have the text version of JSON as well. So again, you can choose if you want to store it as text, if you want to store it as binary. That's an option as well. Sorry, I didn't get that. What is the impact if we don't index and store that as binary? Um, I'll have, I'll, we'll talk after the, okay. after the session. Thank you. Um, so, um, data analytics, uh, another area Postgres has gotten very good at in the past couple of years. Um, things that relational systems do very well, aggregates, optimization, server-side languages, window functions. Um, again, we have things like bitmap scans, which allow for very efficient star joins. Uh, table spaces for uh, spreading your data across multiple table uh, file systems, data partitioning, materialized views, uh, recursive table expressions. Um, they get really good for sort of data warehousing techniques. Um, uh, people are using Postgres to do data warehousing on separate machines, so they use replication to do 
uh, processing on a separate machine without impacting the, the adding overhead to the primary machine. Uh, another example of, of what you want to do. Uh, so again, uh, is Postgres super great for data analytics? Uh, probably not. Uh, there's a lot of really specialized data analytics systems uh, which are designed to be massively parallel. Um, and, and, but they, you know, they're very expensive. They require, they're, they're limited in what they can do. They require a lot to set up. So again, like the NoSQL solutions, Postgres um, is, is very capable of doing data analytics. Um, but there may be some cases where you still want to use uh, you know, a custom piece of software that just does data analytics. But again, you can do quite a bit of data analytics inside of Postgres. The last thing I want to talk about is data, uh, data federation. Uh, this is basically the ability of Postgres to pull data from other data sources. So as I said before, Postgres can do a lot of NoSQL workloads, it can do a lot of data analytics. But maybe that's not enough for you. Maybe you want to still use a custom solution. Maybe you still need uh, you know, massive horizontal scalability, uh, like a Twitter. Okay? But, but you still want a relational system. You still want to integrate that external data store with Postgres. Uh, the good news is that Postgres does allow you to do that. Um, we have interfaces to all of these and many more. Um, so effectively, you can easily access from your relational system external data. And another great example of how Postgres can be the center of your data center, uh, the idea that Postgres uh, acts as, can act as a central data broker for your organization. Uh, and Postgres is uniquely uh, suited for that, partially because of its object relational uh, capability and partially because of its open source nature. It makes it very easy for people to go in, see how things are done, interface efficiently, and make improvements uh, to, again, uh, allow for even better uh, interfacing. We're, 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 in a way, we're data agnostic. The idea of Postgres as a data platform, again, starts to even make more sense when you think of this. Uh, so we have interfaces to, uh, to different, uh, different actual SQL database interfaces like JDBC, LDAP, ODBC. Uh, we have interfaces to, to non-traditional data sources, uh, S3. Uh, you can actually get access to Twitter, which is kind of funny. Um, HTTP, this was mentioned earlier um, as, a, as a way of sort of getting, as Scott had mentioned, as, as a way of sort of going out on the internet from the internet, from the what that went sort of from the database sort of to the internet pulling information down as being a data source. Again, pretty radical, uh, but again, a good example of using Postgres as a central data store and using it uh, to, to make to achieve a significant amount of flexibility. Just an example uh, here to kind of finish up. Uh, basically, we have an example at the top of creating uh, a server, and I'm telling the server how to connect. Uh, this happens to be an example of Postgres connected to Postgres, but again, it, it would look the same if we were connected to any other database, any other data source. Uh, so we're going to create the server here, uh, here, and then we basically create a mapping, and then we create a foreign table on that server, and then if we take a look at um, the foreign data wrappers, you can see we've got a a new table called Other World, which is actually not a table on our system, but a table on a remote system. Uh, you can do accessing, you can have foreign data access to NoSQL solutions like Mongo. You can have uh, foreign data wrapper access to traditional commercial databases like Oracle. And again, you can access non-traditional systems uh, like Twitter just so, uh, what have we talked about? I talked about the object relational nature of Postgres, uh, its ability to be extensible. Uh, I talked about uh, Postgres and NoSQL <coughs> workloads um, and how Postgres is sort of changing to take those into account. Uh, I talked about Postgres data analytics capabilities, again, briefly. And finally, I talked about the ability to access those data sources. Uh, as I said before, Postgres is uniquely positioned uh, to, to sort of take advantage of these technologies 
and in the coming years become a really central part of, of data centers. Um, part of it's the extensibility, part of it's the community, part of it's the open source nature of the database itself, part of it is the high quality and high reliability of the system. But taken all together, um, they're very, very powerful. So this is kind of where I near the end. Um, effectively, we have Postgres at the center, and we have extensions, we have foreign data wrappers, we have NoSQL workloads, and we have data warehousing, all together, all 